Okay, we live. Okay. Good morning, morning, everyone. Uh, we're just going to wait another couple of minutes to allow some more people to join, and then we'll start. Okay, let's go. <clears throat> um, welcome everyone to the token to this webinar on the token platform. Uh, first, let me introduce the speakers. Um, my name is Linda Armani. I'm the token project manager for Funding Box, which is one of the uh, project partners for the token project. Uh, we also have Savas Rogatis, who is the research and innovation manager of the municipality of Katerini in Greece, which is also one of the partners of the token uh, project. We have Jorge Fernandez, who is the CTO of Funnebox and also the lead developer of the token platform. So just to give you uh, an, uh, an overview of the agenda for this morning, uh, Savas will give an overview of the token project. Um, then I will give an overview of the token platform and the services that are available. And then afterwards, Jorge will do a more technical uh, demo. So he'll uh, do a demo of how to implement a solution using the, the token platform. So uh, just before we start, I just want to say that the webinar is going to be recorded and it'll be available later on our on our website, on the token website. Um, if you have any questions during during the session, please ask them. There's a Q&A session in the platform where you can ask your question and we'll answer it at the very end of the session. <clears throat> um, so that's it. Um, I'll pass you over to, to Sabas. Hello, everybody. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, great. So let me share my screen for the presentation. Okay, I hope that you can see my screen right now. Yes, we can see it. Okay, okay, great. So. Hello, everybody, and uh, my name, uh, thank you, Linda. My name is Savas Rogotis, and I am a research and innovation project manager for the municipality of Katerini. The municipality of Katerini is a partner in the construction of the token project. Uh, today, I'm going to present you major aspects about the, um, about the token project, the vision, the goals, and uh, what exactly we are doing in the use cases of the project. And uh, we'll go a little more. more in depth in the specific scenario, specific application scenario that is supported uh, by the municipality of Katerini. So um, the token project is a three-year uh, collaborative research project in the context of the Horizon 2020 framework. Uh, it's uh, 10 partners that are participating in the consortium from several EU countries. And the project has started at the beginning of 2020. Now we are we have just passed half of, it, of its lifespan, and uh, we're continuing with the platform uh, launch, the technological solutions that we are building. Uh, the project's vision um, is to examine the value of uh, distributed uh, ledger technologies in the public sector 
through the development of experimental ecosystem. So here uh, we have tried to identify and to map uh, the major pain points and the challenges that uh, are imposed in the public sector. It can be easily expected that um, many transformations, many shifts in, in the public sector in order to improve uh, societal trust, to lead to an open government model. And of course, this is based on the principles, uh, principles of collaboration, transparency and uh, participation. Also, aspects like efficiency, change in, uh, in culture, in governmental culture, in uh, working habits is very important, together with uh, budgetary pressure. It's always important to keep in mind uh, the budget, especially in public administration. And uh, last but not least, uh, impact factors like all technical, uh, political, legal, also ethical and cultural challenges that are imposed when uh, new solutions and new tools uh, try to find their way into the pipelines and the workflows of public administrations. However, there are opportunities uh, nowadays to mainly with technological solutions that are right and uh, specifically with disruptive uh, technologies like uh, blockchain. can be the front runners of the digital transformation in the public sector and could also be catalysts for yeah, uh, long term. Last... Sorry? Uh, your, your, your presentation disappeared. Shall I share the screen for you? Uh, sorry, let, uh, sorry for that. And now, yes, is it open again? Good. It's open again. Sorry, sorry for yeah. that. I, I, I believe that uh, it's somewhere here that we have uh, it was frozen. And um, as I was saying, uh, these technological solutions could uh, could be catalysts for long term uh, societal change. And it's, this is something that we want to achieve. So distributed electricity technologies are among these technologies that would help uh, public administration in these pivots, in these uh, required shifts uh, for greater efficiency. So who is driving now innovation in the public sector? Um, open governance models with the increase of participation of citizens in the decision-making process is definitely a target here. Um, moreover, governments uh, can be seen as a broad platform for public uh, value creation with more personalized, more collaborative, more transparent workflows, and also the evolution of new and open uh, services uh, for, uh, for the citizens, for the public. Finally, this uh, participatory vision that all uh, public administrations have nowadays uh, implies a bottom-up approach and experimental experimentation having a, a citizen-centric uh, uh, approach. So all requ requirements and needs uh, should come and uh, should stem out from, from the citizen side. Key enablers uh, towards that uh, innovation is um, the availability of uh, new next-generation infrastructures, uh, the value of data, also the ambulance that now exists, uh, policy modeling, policy making uh, procedures, along with measuring and monitoring tools. And uh, last but not least, it's uh, new working uh, practices, civil servants that try to, through personalized learning, through trainings, to evolve and try to embrace these uh, transformations. So these are key enablers that now exist and we can move on to more efficient public administration. Now, the Toki project aims to provide the blockchain platform as a service, as a service solution. Uh, this will enable, enable public agents, agencies to pilot the adoption of distributed ledger technologies as a driver for transformation of, of the public sector. And uh, this towards more, uh, more open, more transparent, more uh, efficient, more trusted services. It can, aims to provide a new type of infrastructure that enables the transformation 
And the value is created here with uh, thanks to all the actors involved that are able to share, interact, and collaborate with their own partners in the consortium. Best practices of uh, new technological solutions like uh, the ones that I mentioned before, distributed ledger technologies, Internet of Things, cloud computing, and uh, big data. And all of this towards uh, preserving major, top, ma major aspects that uh, are um, now should be always acknowledged, like uh, security, privacy, protection of personal data, etc. The benefits of the token uh, platform are uh, Savas, so I can share the screen for yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, I, I had the same problem. Sorry for that. Okay, so now the benefits of uh, the token platform, as I said, are uh, pretty much uh, benefits of the underlying technology, its efficiency, flexibility, transparency, privacy, trustworthiness, and sustainability. In order to examine the application of the technologies into the public sector, uh, the target project has decided to follow a bottom-up approach, as I said, uh, synthesis-centric and has identified it for uh, pioneer use cases with uh, very distinct uh, benefits uh, for, this, uh, for the application scenarios. These are that it will uh, stimulate interaction, experimentation, cross-learning, will stream, uh, streamline the bureaucracy, increase transparency. The technologies are adaptable, uh, are modular, so it can be easily scalable. And of course, they will offer the means for greater uh, privacy, security reasons, self sovereignty and, and more uh, aspects that are very critical in this sense. Here you can see the four use cases. They are the spanning dif four different countries. It's uh, the police use case about public funding distribution, is to bring experience in a state funding project. It's also uh, the use case I'm getting there for later on at this slide. It's the um, uh, Belgium, Belgium, uh, Use case about logistics. Here, the goal is to assess, uh, logistics, assess a specific value of the of DLTs for the urban mobility. Increase urban service efficiency and exploring new economic models. Uh, the Greek use case that I will present you more, uh, more information it's uh, the, uh, about public uh, procurement system. Uh, here we try to incorporate blockchain technologies into the into the municipality of Katerini for public man, public account management. Now getting deeper into the use case, uh, the procurement system in Greece is very very complex uh, system. It involves many actors: civil servants, procurers, policy makers, citizens. Uh, and many steps. Uh, it's partial digitized, so it's not very easy to monitor and high level uh, and to have a high level overview. Uh, not only for a single procurement, but also the, for the procurements of the whole municipality as a whole. And um, in, in most importantly, it keeps the citizens outside the loop. It's very difficult for the citizens to also monitor uh, how the public funding is being uh, spent. So this imposes a major pain point for the municipalities and it also leaves a gap in terms of trust and transparency. Here on the left side, you can see a flow chart, flow diagram with the different um, steps, different uh, subroutines of the procurement system. Uh, on the horizontal axis, you can see the actors involved in the procurement, while on the vertical, uh, the ones that need to sign the documents. You can see that it involves around 20 steps, many actors, many different people that have to sign these documents. And of course, this is um, something that involves, uh, requires a lot of time, a lot of, it's a lot of bureaucracy, to be honest, 
and it's very critical to find a way to cut down these uh, time requirements while improving also the trust and the satisfaction of all stakeholders involved. So here, a blockchain could offer the means and it's an important uh, technological solution that could uh, help us in, uh, in greater transparency in order to uh, be more efficient and avoid uh, bottlenecks. The second sub-use case that we are trying to, to uh, exploit in, the, in, this, uh, in our use case is um, because several uh, procurement procedures uh, require by the law uh, a uh, public deliber deliberation. This is mandatory. So the municipality of Katerini has uh, circulated questionnaires for uh, the citizens, which uh, led to very interesting results. Here you can see that uh, on, the, on your right, top right side, that the level of agreement of the citizens to participate in the decision-making processes is over 50% uh, in the top uh, top layer. And they, they have a high motivation in participating in the decision-making process. At the same time, however, you, we can see that um, there is a lack of uh, trust. You can see on the bottom uh, on the bottom right side that most of uh, the responses do not show a high level of confidence in the results of the voting system. At the same time, also, we can see that more than 80% of the citizens are worried about aspects like anonymization, personal data protection. Here, also, again, blockchain could be a catalyst for greater democratization of the voting uh, systems. It will uh, help uh, citizens trust the procedure, trust the municipality, trust the results, and eventually the procurement procedures and uh, to be in the center, in the spotlight, for uh, in the, a, to have a significant role in the decision-making process about how public funding is being spent. So uh, that's it from my side. Uh, I would like to thank you for your attention. And of course, I I'm open for any questions that you would like to, to ask me. Thanks, Savas. Um, I think we'll we'll wait for the end for for questions. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you have any questions, do put them in the Q and A uh, section. So okay, we'll move on to the next uh, section. So I am going to to give an overview of the token platform and the services that are available. To give a little background before we move on to Jorge's technical demonstration. So just one moment, and I'll share my screen. Okay, you can see my screen? Yes. Okay, okay. So um, what's the token platform? So the, the platform um, is offering a developer-friendly plug-and-play services and open source components for building decentralized apps and services. So what are the, the benefits of the platform? So the, the idea is that there's no need uh, to be a developer with expertise in distributed ledger technologies. The overall goal is to provide, to provide complex decentralized technologies as a service and usable by any development team. So currently it's free during the duration of the project. However, there will be some restrictions on number of users per day per month. Um, the other benefit is that it's blockchain agnostic. So it can be used by any blockchain, like Ethereum, Hyperledger Fabric, et cetera. So there's uh, five layers to the platform technology. Um, there's the discovery layer, which is the developer portal to allow you to access um, and access the services. We have the secure and self-sovereign technical layer, so to reference and register and orchestrate the token services and implement fast prototyping. There's the distributed network layer to deploy nodes and token services. We have a REST, REST API layer, and finally, the documentation layer, which is a token wiki, and that provides all of the information that you need to get started and start prototyping. Um, each service is accessed via an API, um, and there's a, an API gateway for authentication, authorization, and points to the right uh, token API. So the token platform services, there's four blocks of services. We have uh, the blockchain-based notarization, decentralized identity, decentralized storage, and then the messaging and event streaming. So I'll go through each one of these blocks to briefly explain what's there and, and what's available. So to start off with the blockchain notarization, 
It's a set of uh, plug and play services allowed, uh, allowing any organization to smoothly implement uh, proof of authenticity, evidence and provenance in, in your existing applications. And you can do that without investing into your own blockchain or DLT infrastructure. So maybe most of you in the audience know what this is, but just for those who don't, to give you a, a brief uh, summary of what blockchain authorization is, it, it creates a digital fingerprint of a digital piece of information and stores that in the blockchain. Um, so you can create a hash of an existing document, like a digital fingerprint stored in the blockchain. And because it's immutable, uh, you can verify in the future that that document was stored at a specific time. Uh, the token notarization services, uh, we have uh, APIs and also external um, uh, open source components that are provided by our partner, uh, Fireware Foundation, called Canis Major. Um, so the stamp API, it's a, a REST API for to provide anonymous tamper-proof timestamps for any digital content as proof of existence for a given document or data for a transaction in, in a given time. Uh, we have the token registry, which is here known as the anchoring API. Uh, that's a REST API to provide tamper resistance, immutable on-chain storage. So this anchoring API allows you to attach some metadata to the documents you're storing in the blockchain, for example, an issuer or a recipient. And then the Canis Major, as I said, is provided by Fireware outside of the token platform. It's a blockchain adapter that uh, supports various DLTs. So the adapter aims to submit data to the DLT using Fireware uh, technologies. So it basically connects to a designed by Fireware system. Uh, the benefit is you, you don't need to develop your own smart contracts. You don't need to be in a partner of an existing private blockchain network or a public blockchain network. You just need to implement some requests to an API and that service ties together all of the information you are sending to the blockchain. So the next uh, block of services is the decentralized identity. So one of the main uses of, of decentralized technology is, is decentralized identity. Um, so the users or citizens have many uh, digital identities and some of our data is managed by private organizations or public entities. And some of this data has been exposed in breaches. So this is one of the reasons why decentralized identity has come about. So every person has the right to own their own identity and it should be data that is only used when, when the user gives their consent. So this doesn't happen, always happen, but with uh, decentralized identity and self-sovereign identities, uh, the user controls and owns and hosts their own verified credentials and their consent is always required uh, to use those credentials. So we have, as part of the token identity services, we have the token connect and also the self-sovereign um, identity. So this is uh, provided by our partner CERTH, which is the Center for Research and Technology Hellas in, in Greece. So the token connect, uh, token connect, the scope of the token connect for now is just authentication. So it's a simple implementation to allow you integrate this type of mechanism DID into your existing applications, but only within the scope of authentication. So it allows you to um, accept decentralized identifiers to log in or sign in to an existing application. So it doesn't cover all the functionalities of a full SSI solution. Um, it's like a, a user wallet or agent where you can create your identity um, and you can put some self-claim data there, like your name, um, and use this to log into or sign into an existing um, application. So the authentication with Token Connect, just to briefly explain how it works. So the user gets the user agent, which in this case is a Token Connect wallet. Um, it's, it's a web browser extension. In the future, we may have a mobile app uh, feature. Uh, so the user sends the DID address to the website, then the website is able to, using your DID address and a universal resolver to check the DLT location where this information is stored. To, so it gets a public key of your DID address and the website creates a challenge where only the owner of this DID address can fulfill. So it's a way to prove that the user is the owner of the DID address. Uh, the token wallet gets the challenge, decrypts it um, with a private key, sends the result to the website the website checks if the result is correct and allows the user to access the website. So it's a mechanism quite similar to existing authentication mechanisms like OpenID, uh, but instead of using an external identity provider, you're using a decentralized identity, uh, which you created yourself. So the SURF SSI solution is a platform in which a user can register 
get ID and request um, their and present credentials. It's accessed outside of the token platform, so it's accessed via the S Surf SSI platform. Uh, it's a full self-sovereign identity solution and provides all of the features and mechanisms to issue, verify, and manage the credentials, and also create all the components you need uh, within these types of uh, interactions. So this diagram just gives an overview of, of how the CERT SSI solution works and the different components. Um, so just to give you an example, if you are a university, any user can create its own DID, then request you, the university, to issue a diploma. So you will have the mechanism to issue the diploma, write it to the blockchain or DLT, and then issue the credential and send it to the holder. So on the other hand, if you're an employer, you can also use this solution to get the diploma from the user and be able to read from the distributed ledger and check and verify if the diploma is valid and if it was actually issued by the university and not revoked, for example. So the next block of services we have is the decentralized storage. Um, the, the token storage network, it's a distributed system for storing and accessing files, websites, applications, and data. So using the content address rather than its location. So these are the core features. It's decentralized, which means um, that there's a set of peer-to-peer -peer nodes intended to store information in a distributed way. So basically, it replaces a typical cloud infrastructure. There's no single organization managing the data. Um, there's a unique identification via content addressing which means that when you want to access a document, you need to the content identifier, which is basically the hash of the document. Um, it's immutable. So if you modify a document and upload it again, this won't play, replace the previous document. It actually creates a new one. Um, we have redundancy and persistence. So when you upload a document, the, ne the network calculates the fingerprint, splits the document into many blocks, um, and can replicate, replicate that over many nodes. So even if one of the nodes goes down, the data is still there because the nodes will have the content. Um, and then the documents can be private or public. So it can be accessed using a REST API or via a HTTP gateway, which is, for example, um, a browser. So these are just some of the main features of this token storage network. It provides, you can create public stores, private encrypted data stores, uh, personal data stores, and also you can create automations with other token services. Um, so the personal data store, for example, you can write, you can create a folder for users where some of your documents, um, which your users may access, uh, you can create it so that it's encrypted and only the person, people who have access it can, can access those, those folders or those files. We have a couple of additional um, token services like the IPF gate, IPFS gateway, which allows you to access a document using a web browser. Um, or uh, also we have this IPFS uh, pinning service. So this means that the documents will always be available until you need them. They won't be automatically uh, removed after a certain amount of time until you unpin it. And the final um, block of services we have uh, is the messages and events streaming. So uh, it's like a secure WhatsApp uh, with the proof of receiving or sending a message tied to a blockchain, like in the notarization service. So instead of having a central machine handling the different jobs, the messages are distributed um, among different nodes. So it's a way to communicate, to create a communication channel from peer to peer. So app to a person or an app to another service or microservice uh, to, to multiple people. So that's the services. Um, and I just wanted to summarize, as, as Savas said in his previous uh, presentation, we have uh, four token use cases. So these are four use cases that are being developed in order to make use and demonstrate how these, how the token platform and the DLT services can be can be used within public services. So um, in the Greece, which Savas already explained, we have the 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 use case of improving procurement processes in the municipality of Katerini. Um, we and Fundybox are developing a use case to improve public funding distribution processes in competitive open calls. Um, in Santander, they're, they're creating a data marketplace uh, where citizens and companies can track the use of their data and later possibly monetize it through the use of smart contracts. And in Leuven, in Belgium, they're improving the last mile logistics and the local economy in the city of Leuven. 
So just to give you an example of which of the token services we're using, for example, in the public funding um, use case, we're going to use the Stamp API and Anchoring API for uh, time stamping the application of, um, of users. So when someone applies for funding, we're going to use Token Connect to allow users to use a DID to sign up or log in when they're creating an application. And the token storage, we're going to use for storing documents and binary data to public or private data stores and the token streams for notifying applicants about their application process. So um, that's it. Um, next steps, um, you can visit the token platform website where you'll get all the information and also be able to request access to the developer console. Um, you can join the discussion in the Spaces community if you want to give your opinion, suggest a use case, or ask a general question. And finally, there's a, a Bling Hackathon, which stands for Blockchain in Government, happening on the 13th and 14th of November, where you can develop a solution using the token platform. So I hope that gives a good overview of the token platform and services. Um, and now we'll go ahead and move on to Jorge, who can give us a, a demonstration of the token platform. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. OK, um, so basically, uh, in this last slot, uh, in 30 minutes, I will try to demonstrate uh, how to implement uh, the token services and decentralization on existing solutions or um, building something uh, from scratch. Uh, so basically, uh, well, uh, probably, uh, trying to implement all the services the token platform offers. It's a bit uh, difficult uh, in 30 minutes. So uh, we define a use case, which is basically try to create a WeTransfer uh, clone uh, using the token services in those uh, 30 minutes. So, OK, so let me share my screen and I will start uh, introducing you the, the steps. So. Okay. So, can you see the screen now? Yeah, we can see your screen. Okay. Okay. So, um, yeah, this is the, the the objective of the of this slot uh, to demonstrate how to implement uh, the services on an existing solution or creating something from scratch. Uh, I will try to build a we transfer clone in 30 minutes. If you don't know uh, what we transfer is, it's a very well known uh, provider of uh, file exchange. So basically, uh, we we transfer offers the possibility to upload a document to their uh, tool and then share this link share this link via email or any other uh, method uh, with uh, with another user. Uh, usually, it was. Uh, was used mostly for uh, big files. So when you need to share something which is very big, like uh, several gigabytes, uh, you use it to use this type of services. So I will try to um, to create the same, but using the token services. In this case, we will try to use the uh, distributed theft storage uh, services plus the notarization in order also to create like an audit log, make a thing blockchain. Uh, about who is who are creating the documents, who are sending the documents, and who are accessing and downloading also the, the documents. So um, to start, the first thing you need to uh, do is basically go to the uh, platform website, okay, and uh, request access uh, to start uh, consuming the, the the different services the platform provides okay so basically you just need to put your email submit uh, this uh, request and uh, you will receive an invitation to uh, create an account into the into the platform in the in the in the next days i already have an account so let me sign in just for you to know how to do it Okay, so basically, I already created my account, and this is my dashboard. Uh, the first thing I need to do, obviously, to start uh, using the services, obviously, create the account, and then uh, generate the credentials I will, I will need uh, to start consuming the services. Most of the services, as uh, Linda mentioned before, uh, 
most of the services are uh, based on REST APIs. So basically there is a uh, REST uh, gateway API uh, and through this gateway, you can consume all the different all the different services. Uh, not all of them. In the case of Canis Major, this is not a um, a service. It's a component you can download and deploy in your own premises or infrastructure. And in the case of the third SSI solution, which is also a full stack uh, self sovereign identity solution, or we can refer it as a self sovereign identity as a service. Uh, this uh, this uh, solution has has its own its own uh, platform, so you need to go there and create also your your own credentials. But for the rest of the services, uh, like the related uh, communications or storage or notarization, uh, you just need to create an account here in the platform and then generate your credentials. Okay. In order to generate your credentials, you need for the first thing create your developer account. You, would, you need to request an, uh, to request access, then you will receive an invitation and then you can create your account. After you have your developer account, you need to create an organization profile with very basic uh, information. And once you have an organization created, uh, then you need to create an application. And when you create an application, you need to, you should uh, point which uh, services you plan to use uh, with this uh, application, okay? So once you create the application and define the services you intend to use, uh, you will receive your uh, credentials to start using the APIs. For example, in this case, uh, I created this storage application. Uh, this is the data I, I submitted. And I plan to use, for example, the storage network and the IPFS uh, related uh, services Basically, the token storage network comes in different flavors, um, and there are different uh, services also. There is a, a pinning service uh, based on IPFS, uh, there is a, a IPFS gateway, and there is a public uh, network where you can upload documents to a public um, that will be accessible by, by anyone. But there is also a private version where you can create, uh, let's say, private data stores uh, to store data that only you can access. So, uh, well, this is the difference between uh, when we refer to storage network private and, or IPFS, uh, we usually refer to, pu to public, okay? And I will activate also the notarization services. And then I get my uh, credentials to start consuming the APIs. Um, basically, just uh, a client ID and a client secret, which is uh, uh, typical for any uh, REST API. <coughs> so, uh, once we have, um, well, answering uh, Daniel, uh, we need uh, to create an organization. This is also uh, for for us to uh, to know. Um, what type of interest is, uh, uh, what type of organization are interested on in this type of uh, technologies, but also uh, for, because a legal thing regarding the service level agreements and this type of things. So, okay, uh, so already have my credentials, so I can start consuming the, the services. Uh, most of the services, well, you can find the documentation. Uh, In this wiki, for example, here you will find some instructions about how to create the account, the organization, uh, the applications, and how to authenticate against uh, the API, and which are the specific endpoints for the specific services, like the stamping or uh, the storage uh, API, etc. Okay, so basically, uh, the first thing. Once I have my credentials, uh, the first thing is to um, exchange my uh, client ID and client secret for a token. Okay? So basically, as I mentioned before, all the all the services are um, available via a, a, a API gateway, and the API gateway URL is uh, api.token-project.eu, and uh, so the first thing, the first thing obviously is to uh, to uh, generate an access code. Okay. So in order to generate an access code, uh, I need to uh, point to the 
auth endpoint slash token and here put the my client id or key and my secret uh, <coughs> and my secret as, a, as as the parameters okay once i send this i, I get my access uh, token and with this token i can start consuming the specific endpoints for each of the services okay so well uh, i will try to uh, create as i said these uh, solutions this <coughs> we transfer clone and start implementing the services so the first thing well uh, as these are restful services they are very easy to implement in any kind any type of language or framework in my case i'm gonna use uh, javascript and i'm gonna use a framework called meteor uh, that um, uh, it allows you to create uh, a website or an app in a very easy way and very fast so <coughs> let's try to do this uh, I already created the, let's say, the boilerplate for this uh, application, okay? Uh, so I have already created all the uh, document structure, but in any case, if you want to try Meteor, it's very easy. You just need to start creating an application. Once you install Meteor, you just need to uh, write Meteor, create, and the name of the app you want to create, and this creates uh, the structure of files and folders and a very basic uh, application just uh, rendering like an HTML or something like that. Uh, when you use Meteor, you can use different, uh, also different engines like React or Blaze or Vue. Uh, you have many different options. In my case, I choose uh, Blaze, which is a, a rendering engine based on templates, very similar to um, handlebars, uh, for example. Okay. So, well, basically, I already created this boilerplate, and this is the file structure and fi uh, folders structure. Okay, so here uh, you, you need to start uh, putting your 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 code. Okay, so let me launch this application. Uh, in our case. Uh, Usually, after you install Meteor and create the basic structure for your application, you need to install also the packages you, you plan to uh, or you intend to use. In our case, just to consume the uh, REST API services, uh, we need to install one single package. With the, uh, I decided to install UniREST, which is a package to uh, you know basically uh, to make a request to a REST uh, service. But you can use there are many different options out there you can use. Uh, this is pretty simple, so this is the, the one I choose. Okay, so the application is uh, ready now. So I can go to the browser and localhost 3000 is the port, and this is basically. Uh, the uh, the application as series by default okay basically this is rendering a specific template called landing so you can see here this is the hello world i save my uh this file this should refresh automatically okay so this is the application as it is right now okay so yeah uh now it's time to start creating this uh, WeTransfer clone. Basically, uh, the idea of WeTransfer is that, well, you just need to upload a document. And then once you upload the document, you will you will receive a link. And then you can share this link with, uh, with a colleague or another user. Uh, you can share this link by yourself, or even the, the, the service can send this link by email automatically okay so let's try to do this but uh, instead of uh, uploading the document to a private cloud or amazon s3 or google or whatever uh, cloud service storage service uh, we will use the token storage as i mentioned um, there are different possibilities there you can uh, upload it to a public uh, uh, version of the network where all the documents will be public and you need to you need to know the um, the uh, CID, CID uh, to access the file but there is also a possibility to create uh, encrypted data stores or private uh, data stores uh, if you don't if you don't want to 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 
you, if you don't want that others may access your your files in this case since uh, the intention is to exchange uh, those documents we will use the the public uh, the public version okay <coughs> So, um, what we need uh, to start doing this? Well, basically, uh, the first thing is to create a file input into this uh, first template. Okay. So, I will uncomment something of this. And basically, okay, let's. Okay. Well, basically, I just need to add this, uh, an input file, okay, uh, with some ID, and I'm going to save this, okay, okay, and this is the, the, the result. Now, I have the input, so I can choose a document, whatever. Now, uh, we need to work on the logic to handle the event of selecting a document and then after the document is selected, upload it automatically uh, to, uh, to the token storage network, for example. Okay, uh, let's check the, the methods or endpoints uh, to, to upload a file before uh, continuing. So basically, okay. This is the IPFS, okay. So uh, the main endpoint to upload a file basically is, uh, well, api.tokenu.pro.u slash IPFS slash add, okay. Uh, this is a post, you need to put your access token into the header, authorization header, and then you just need to, uh, to reference the file you want to upload or the data you want to upload. Okay, you can also upload folders, uh, not uh, not just single uh, single files. Okay, so sorry. Okay, so let's try how this works. As I mentioned, let's authenticate as the first thing. Okay. Uh, so I get my access token. I'm going to copy my access token. Here it is. Then I go to the assign point. I will put my access token on the uh, on the authorization header. Okay. And then I want to upload this file. So this is the endpoint. This is the file. Uh, I already added the access token and then I just send. Okay. And the file was already uh, uploaded. Uh, to the network and this is the hash and the size of the file I, I have uploaded. Let's also check if this was if, if this is accessible via uh, the browser. So I just need to write something like IPFS token so IPFS. IPFS and the hash. Okay, so uh, here is the document once it was uploaded to the to the network. Okay, so everything looks uh, looks fine. So this is the endpoint. Let's start coding the thing. Okay, the first thing is okay. I have this uh, file input. Uh, let's add the logic to uh, manage the event or selecting the, the the file. Okay, so for the logic, I go to this. Um, uh to this file which is a javascript file and here for my template which is in this case the template i'm rendering is this one called uh, landing i want to attack attach an event and in this case the event is uh, when the input which is a file changes okay so basically i have an input uh, which is a file here, and once I, uh, the user selects this and use and selects a document, and this changes. So uh, the thing I need to do is to uh, send or store this information or this file uh, before submit this to the storage network. Well, in fact, there are many different ways to achieve this. Uh, probably this is not the most elegant one. But uh, what we are trying to do here is basically, okay, let's try to store the file into a temporary uh, folder 
And then uh, on the server side, uh, we will call the API and we will upload the document and then we will remove the temporary, the temporary file, okay? Okay, so basically, um, this is the, the logic for the event. I'm creating a new HTTP request for a, 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 um, a local uh, URL where we will handle uh, this, uh, this event to store the file I'm attaching here, okay? So uh, basically, this is the code, uh, pretty simple. And, and now, well, this is the code on the client side, I mean the browser. And now I need to write the code on the server side that is gonna to store the file and then upload it to the to the network. Okay. So basically, uh, I tell here that this is gonna open a URL in the local uh, uh, server, which is a file. So I need to create this root and the methods to handle the uh, the document, store it into a temporary folder, and then upload it to the to the IPFS. Okay. So um, to create the root, I'm using this code. Okay. Basically, uh, I'm putting here the um, the the root, you know, the uh, the type of uh, the type of action I'm I'm accepting. This is a put. Then I'm receiving the uh, file. Okay, and basically we are storing using the node file system into a temporary um, into a temporary uh, folder. Okay, I hard coded this. Uh, this is obviously not the the uh, the best way to do it, but uh, for the example, it's enough. I hard coded this, so basically this will handle uh, the document and store it here in this uh, in this path. And after that, uh, we need to call uh, the API endpoint to store to store this into the storage network. Okay. <clears throat> so the first thing, let's save this into a temporary uh, uh, folder. And after this greeting, if everything goes well, then I can call uh, the REST endpoint to store this to into the into the storage network. Okay. So uh, this is done here, the, here is saving the file, and then this is the way to call the uh, API endpoint. This is a function I created before, which is add file call, call. So basically, this is the, uh, this is the, yeah. This is the uh, call to call the, the API, okay? Bas basically, it's, it's a simple, it's a, uh, implementation of this uh, of this call you can see the code here using unirest for example basically it's a post to this url this is the access token and then you attach the file that you already save it into a, a temporary folder okay so if everything goes well, you will receive a response like this with the name of the file, uh, with the hash and the size of the file, okay? So uh, obviously, as I mentioned before, before attacking this endpoint, you need to authenticate. So I also need to authenticate here in my, uh, in, my uh, in this website or on this tool. So I, I, ha I have hard coded here the um, parameters I need, basically, the client ID I created when I created the application in the developer portal or the platform, the secret, uh, the keys I'm using uh, in order to authenticate because those are the parameters I need for authentication, key and secret. Uh, sometimes you uh, you use other other um, names for the for these parameters like client ID or client secret. Uh, we use key and secret. Okay, so I have coding this. This is the authorization endpoint, API token project U auth token, and this is the um, endpoint to upload a, a file to the storage network, IPFS add, also on API token project U. And this is for the notarization that we will use uh, later. So the first thing is, okay, we need to uh, get a token. So basically this is the 
code to uh, generate the token. I'm, I'm sending a post request to the host and this path uh, using my ID and secret. And as a response, you will receive an access token like this. And once you have your access token, then you can call the next uh, request, which is add file, which is basically to uh, here, IP token provides you, IPFS add, and then the uh, token I have coded here. <laughs> Obviously, this is not the, the the best way to do it. Okay, you, you never, you cannot, uh, you cannot put your uh, credentials into the code. Uh, you should use a more safe way to do it. But well, uh, just for as an example, I am coding them, uh, and then attach the file that I started before. Okay, so basically, uh, this is the code, and let's see if if this works. So I'll go back to the template. This is the file input. Then I go to the logic. Okay, this is calling this URL, sending the document to this URL. Let's check the method. Okay, so when this calls this URL, I'm saving the file here, here in this report in this folder. And then I'm calling the uh, endpoint to upload this to the to the to the network. And if everything goes well, I will receive the hash of the document. Okay, let's back here. So the response should be the hash of the uploaded document and i will store this into a uh, into a session variable okay uh, so let's check go back to here so uh, what it should do this is that as well as uh, soon i select a file here this file should be automatically uploaded to the network and then um, i will receive a hash let me check the console. I will receive a hash, and basically with the hash, I can access the, the, the document, OK? So I will check Let's... what's happening here, OK? So this is the file I sent. This is uh, the progress. Uh, it was a very small file, so uh, only shows the 100%. This is the hash of the document uploaded, and what well, this is uh, the final result. As the final result, I put here that as soon as I have uh, the hash, I'm hiding uh, the form, and then I'm showing the final link. Okay, basically I did this with this um, with these blocks. So I'm as I mentioned before, I am storing a, bara, a session variable, which is file of doll, uploaded with the, with the uh, hash of the document. And then once I have the, uh, this uh, session variable, then I hide this part, the form, and I show the, the URL of, for downloading the file. OK, okay so um, this is what's done with success. Let's check if the document is accessible yeah it seems it's accessible everything uh, went well so basically uh, we have a very basic implementation of a solution to upload a document a big document for example to a decentralized uh, storage network um, this is already work working so i can get this link and share this link with um, a colleague for example okay so let's try now uh, to add a bit more uh, complexity here instead of just uploading the document and getting the link let's try to create a more complex form where i can also uh, put some message uh, and an email address to send this automatically to the uh, recipient okay so let's check if there is a uh... Okay, but I will try to answer the questions uh, at the end. Okay, so let's 
tweak this a bit. I can remove this now. And instead of showing that just the uh, input field, I'm going to create a more complex form. To do this, I'm going to use a package that um, uh, you may install for Mitchell, which is uh, simple schema, and also another package, which is out of form. Uh, basically, those are packages that allow you to create uh, dynamically a form just defining the, the schema, OK? So I will show you how to create the form and the schema. So um, well, basically, I want to create a form so the user can put the, uh, the email address and the recipient email address, also a message, attach the document, and automatically send the uh, email to the recipient. But I also want to store this information for later. So I will create um, a collection into a database to store also this information. By default, in this case, Meteor uses uh, Meteor, uh, digo, I mean, uh, Mongo, OK? So I need to create a, a Mongo uh, collection. And, and with a simple schema, I will create the data schema for this collection. And with auto form, I will render the final, uh, the final form, OK? So well, basically, I already created the collection, but it's pretty simple. Uh, the code is pretty simple. Basically, you define the name of the collection, which is file. Uh, you can also define how you want to generate the ID. You can use just a, a string or an object ID in the case of uh, Mongo, and then attach the schema, which is uh, based on this package I mentioned before, which is simply a schema. Uh, in this case, what I need, well, basically, uh, the date when the document or, uh, was uploaded, the URL, the hash, uh, the email of the sender, the email of the recipient, a subject and the message uh, to send the email. Okay, so basically, I'm creating this simple schema in the case, well, defining uh, these properties like the type of uh, field, uh, if it's opt optional or not, what type of input I want to render, if it's a, a text field or a file, or if it's hiding, like in this case, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so uh, with this simple schema, uh, we are defining at the same time the schema of the collection in Mongo, but also uh, this is this is the schema that we are going to use to render a form automatically. Okay, so basically, I save this and then I go to the landing and I'm going to render here the the form okay basically uh with this code which is quick form the collection i want to render in this case i'm referring to the files collection i will put an id for this form some classes if you need and the type of form and uh, this can be an update insert uh, etc i'm rendering an insert form so basically uh, i want to insert a document into the database and at the same time in, uh, send this information by email to the recipient okay so i will refresh the website once i made this change and this is the final result okay i have now a form which is more similar about uh, more similar with uh, what we transfer provides let's check how we transfer oops okay this is we transfer basically a, do, a button to upload the documents, uh, the email of the recipient, the email of the sender, the subject, the message, and some options. For example, if you want to send it by email or just get the link. And if you are, have a pro, a pro account, uh, you can decide when. Uh, when to remove the file from the cloud and all and this stuff. Okay. Okay. So let's try to mimic this. So here is the form, the document sent uh, to your email address, the subject, and the message. So uh, automatically, as I created the collection and the schema, uh, automatically, as soon as I fill this uh, form, uh, this will create the um, this will create the the item on into the into the database okay but uh, obviously before creating the uh, item into the database i need to store the file as uh, i did previously and i also once since confirmed that the uh, record was uh, inserted into the database i want to send the email 
Okay. So let's check also the logic for sending the email because the logic for managing the input file is this keeps the same because I had attached this event to any type of um, file input and now we also have a file input here okay and uh, yeah what I'm gonna do is okay uh, auto form automatically inserts the data into the database but uh, as I mentioned before I want also to send an email after the information is inserted into the database so what I'm gonna do is to create a hook attached to this specific sorry to this specific form uh, upload file okay so I will attach a hook that means that um, this uh, this piece of code will be uh, will run um, when something happens on this specific form okay so I have touched some uh, hooks here before insert I'm changing the class of the button to show a loading indicator for example I also want to uh, log some uh, data if there is a re an error, I want to uh, showcase the error in the console. And if, every, if everything goes fine, I want to send an email. And to send an, to send an email uh, with this uh, information, I need to create this method called send file by email. OK, so let's go back to the server methods. OK, BBP. OK. And here is the method I create to send an email. Okay, basically I'm receiving some data that is the data I populated here in the form. Okay, uh, but after being inserted into the database, so I will also receive some additional data like uh, the ID of the um, of the record. Okay, and with this data I want to send an email to the recipient from the sender with the subject I write I wrote here and uh, the message and obviously the link to the to the file okay so this is ready let me review everything in case i forgot something i submit it mm -hmm. okay okay so let's check Okay, so I want to select here this. Okay. Oh, yeah, sorry. I forgot to change something here. Okay, okay let's try again. I'm selecting the file. the schema uh, files oh yeah okay Okay, let's check if this was inserted into the database. It seems some problem. Valid date. Let's 
try to remove this. And try again. It seems working. Yeah, it doesn't show here, but it should be there. Okay, so um, let me check if the email is being sent also. So let me check here the method. Try again just to check. Uh, we are reaching this code. So this is working. Okay. So basically, I am uh, sending the email uh, with this information to the recipient. I am also storing this into the uh, database. Okay. And uh, what's next? Well, we may improve this uh, in many different ways. I don't know if I, if I still have time, um, Linda. Yeah, we are running over by a few <laughs> yeah. minutes, but, but if you're close, I think. Yeah, and well, um, yeah, just uh, five more minutes to try to implement also the notarization part. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. So let's back to the website. Okay. So I have implemented the uh, storage uh, service. This is information, these those documents are being deployed to the uh, network. They are accessible. Uh, um, from the web because they are deployed to a public network. We are sending this information by email to the recipient. At the same time, we are storing this information into the database. And now, uh, for example, it would, be, it would be nice also to implement the notarization service, for example, in order to log all those transactions that are happening on the, on the service. For example, when I upload uh, a document, it would be interesting to uh, store the hash into the blockchain. So in the future, you may prove that this specific document or already existed in a specific point of time but I also it could be also interesting uh, to try to log some transactions like for example when the user or the recipient downloads the file or access the file okay so uh, to do is uh, well uh, it's also pretty basic, pretty basic as in the previous case uh, the implementation of the service is just uh, you just need to um, to request uh, an endpoint, in this case, uh, the notarization API has this endpoint, which is a stamp. And this stamp endpoint uh, accepts two parameters, which is hash and data. Okay. Basically, uh, usually I just need to um, timestamp uh, the hash of the document, but in some uh, in some cases you may also need to add some metadata. So. Um, you can add both, just the hash or the hash plus data, which basically refers to uh, metadata, like, for example, I don't know, identifier of the recipient or an IP address of the uh, people who is downloading the file or whatever. Obviously, uh, uh, we cannot or we should not uh, never uh, include metadata uh, refers to the person or personal information because all the GDPR uh, rules and stuff okay uh, because as you know uh, once uh, this information is in blockchain is there forever uh, so you cannot remove uh, those uh, information you are attaching here from the from the blockchain network okay so uh, in order to implement this into this existing application we are building well uh, you obviously need to create the function the function to uh, call this uh, endpoint which is basically as I configured here is um, 
this is the host and this is the endpoint and the parameters is basically well the authorization header with the access token and then the hash with the data hash that is the the hash of the document i have just uploaded and automatically the storage network uh, res response is basically the the hash so i can just store this automatically okay so uh, this is the uh, function to do it and the way to implement this in a let's say transparent way is uh, for example using also uh, in the case of meteor for example using collection hooks collection hooks are pieces of code or, or processes that are attached to some event happening on a record on a collection okay so i can for example if i want to, to create some automation like this uh, when i create upload the document or when i create the registry or when i create when i send the uh, email for example i just need to add something like this uh so this is the collection files so let's attach a hook like after insert i will run this code for example uh, i have also created a collection which is an audit log and i'm uh, putting here the action i want to um, i want to uh, log there and the parameters blah 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 but in the case of the notarization services i would need just to uh, call this uh, yeah sorry basically just call this function i can put this into this insert hook with this argument or i can pass additional arguments if i want to add also uh, additional metadata and that's all just with this line uh, this will automatically send this to the uh, blockchain basically uh, the hash uh, of this document if i want to uh, log for example who is accessing the file well uh, then i can create like for example a specific route for accessing the file instead of using the uh, ipfs gateway i can create a route for example download and the hash of the document and then redirect this to the uh, final document but attaching also an event to this route like for example okay uh, let's files update no. files update the id no this is a hash Ink. Um, for example, uh, no, ink. Downloads. Okay. What I'm doing here basically is okay. I'm creating a specific route for downloading the file I'm receiving in my email. Okay. And when I go to this uh, route, basically this in, in increments uh, uh, a counter into the database. Uh, with the number of downloads and at the same time i am attaching here a hook to the update process on the database so as soon as this uh, file is updated into the database i can attach here also an um, automation like for example stamping the hash and some parameters okay parameters okay um well uh yeah that well, i don't know if <laughs> if uh, i need more than 30 minutes probably but uh well this is just an, an example about how to uh, how easy it is to uh, implement these uh, restful uh, services as uh, improvements we can do uh, on this um, on this type of uh, solution for example on this we transfer clone well we could also uh, allow the users to upload entire folders we can also add the pinning uh, ipfs mechanism because for example right now when i upload in a document to the storage network the document will be there uh, in the network as soon as um, 
uh, requested. So, for example, there is like a garbage collector that is removing the, fil the files that were that were not accessed in a long time. Okay, but for example, using the the pinning service, you can ensure that uh, the file will be uh, distrib distributed among a minimum number of nodes and will never uh, be removed from the network. Okay. In this case, like for example, imagine that okay, like I allow you to upload a document and this document will be removed automatically in two weeks, for example. But if you have a premium account, you can select the files that you want. To, you want to keep forever, for example. Okay. Uh, another improvement we could we could add here. Well, probably for example the private data stores or the encrypted data stores that we are not using in this example. Also the user management, for example, using the third self sovereign solution, we could send instead of sending the documents to an email, we can send the documents to a decentralized identifier, and then the user without creating an account, just using the decentralized identifier, can log in into the solution and access the files that were shared uh, with them. Uh, or for example, also uh, use the token streams to create a secure communication cha channel with the uh, recipients okay uh, and well basically that's um, uh, well basically that's the example of well how easy it is to implement this type of technologies and how uh, you know um, how convenient is since obviously when we are talking about blockchain dlts decentralization obviously there are many infrastructure uh, uh, involved with that is not easy to understand to deploy and to maintain uh, so this type of services uh, basically aims to uh, allow the developers to go uh, to develop faster and start implementing this type of uh, decentralized uh, technologies in a more easy way and that's all i think Great, I mean, I, I can stay for an hour if needed. I, I know. Doing this, but, uh, yeah. Thanks, Jorge. Um, we've got quite a few questions. Um, and since yeah. we're running over time, maybe we'll just answer a couple. And then any questions that haven't been answered, we will reply to all of them. Uh, okay. You'll find the answers in the spaces. So uh, there was one question where uh, a couple of people asked, who can use a platform? Can it be a private user? Or can, it, can it only be a company? Yeah. Uh, can can private users sign up to to the to the developer platform or can it only be a company? Yeah, well, uh, basically, um, right now you need to request access to access the platform and create your developer account and credentials and so on. And usually, um, uh, usually you will need to create an organization uh, in order to uh, generate the credentials. But it's not, um, let's say, a requirement. You can create your developer account and just create a fake organization or you know uh, something uh, like that. And then you can use the services with, uh, without a uh, problem. Okay. OK, we had another question from someone asking, uh, if the, is, the, is the saved file encrypted? Yeah, it depends on the flavor you are there are different endpoints and some of them uh, may include the ability to automatically encrypt the data uh, but it depends if you are using the private uh, storage or the public storage in the case of the public storage by default is not encrypted uh, and in the case of the private storage there are like different possibilities uh, to uh, encrypt the data automatically or encrypt the data based on the ids uh, and this type of uh, infra or, or, or public uh, key infrastructure uh, where there are different um, possibilities there. Okay, great. Um, so I think what we'll do is we've 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 made it we've made it we've made a note of all the questions, so we'll answer those in the spaces. Um, and uh, just to remind everybody that we have we have recorded this, and we'll send all the links later to everyone who attended. So we'll wrap up. Um, thanks, Jorge. Thanks, Salas. And uh, thanks, everyone, for attending. And uh, have a nice rest of your Thank day. You. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Bye. everybody.